Welcome to the 2021 Fall Convocation Program. Thank you for joining us for this special event today to celebrate LAS recipients, award recipients, faculty promotions, and new faculty and staff. Before we get started with the State of the College and awards presentation, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Keeping with the Iowa State and CDC guidelines, masks are encouraged at this event. Um, I want to just for full disclosure tell you that while I'm at the podium, I will remove my mask while I'm speaking, but I'm fully vaccinated. To the best of my knowledge, I have not been exposed and I feel just fine. So that should be about as good as it gets. Uh, we do have a few bottles of hand sanitizer located throughout the room. We have uh, one here at the front, one at the awards table, and there are a few more around the room if you want to use them. During the awards presentation, uh, we'll call up the award winners to receive their awards and take a photo with me. Now, um, when I'm standing there, I'll be wearing my face mask and I'll watch for your cues. So if you would like your photo taken without a mask, just take yours off, I'll take mine off too. Um, and if you'd like to receive a handshake, then just show me that you want a, a handshake, otherwise we'll do whatever else you feel comfortable with. So today we have much to celebrate. But first, I would like to share a few things about the college, where we are and where we are going. So this is the state of the college presentation that I'm gonna to move to now. And we have a wonderful photo here of one of our students who participated in an LAS undergraduate research project. And you can see her through the zebrafish aquarium in the uh, Advanced Teaching and Research Building. All right, so this is the agenda, looking back, LAS today, and looking forward. And the first thing I wanna do is I just wanna say thank you. Uh, we're coming out of a very, very difficult year. It's been very stressful. It's maybe not quite as good as we hoped it would be this fall, but, oops, still playing, I have to let it play. Hang on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There we go. So I just want to say you've continued to put students first. You moved courses online at a moment's notice. You managed to keep your research, your scholarship going as much as possible. You supported your kids, your parents, your friends, colleagues, and many others in the community. And through all of that, you dealt with um, uncertainty, disruption, and fear. This fall, some things are better. Okay, I'll just remind you, we do have effective vaccines now. We know much more about COVID-19 and how it uh, interacts with the human body. We do get to see each other and our students in person again. And I've heard from so many people the excitement that students have expressed about being back in the classroom. But I also want to acknowledge that there is still considerable uncertainty, disruption, and fear, and we will continue to advocate for your needs. I'll just point out a few things that thanks to your advocacy and your suggestions, we were able to accomplish. The alternate work policy for faculty who are immunocompromised or live with immunocompromised family members, we didn't have that at the beginning of the semester and now we do. The flexibility for temporary modality shifts for instructors who've tested positive but want to and are able to work remotely. So, you know, both of these policies take a little bit of pressure off from uh, some of our most vulnerable people. I also want to say that we have always had some flexibility in supporting faculty and staff who experience medical or other emergencies, and we will continue to use that flexibility. I do ask for one thing, however. Please do not move your course online, even temporarily, without talking to someone first. Talk to your department chair, who will involve Arne Hallam, and assuming the modality shift is improved, you will then have the backing of the university should a student or parent voice some concerns about the shift of modality. Now, despite of these challenges, we have accomplished so much, and I'll just, you know, I'll just pick a few examples of the excellent research in the college. If I were to pick all of them, we'd be here all week. Um, this is Andy King. He's an assistant professor in the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, and he actually received 
a, um, a substantive, a significant grant from the National Institutes of Health. Um, and you know, you may wonder why does a journalist, a journalism professor receive that? That's because Andy works on natural language processing and crowdsourcing to study public information and communication disparity about colon cancer. So sharing messages about health and disease and hoping to identify what messages are most effective to encourage um, behaviors that lead to the acceptance of health mitigation. So while he's working on colon cancer, I think we all appreciate how important that work is, especially today. Um, here is another highlight that I want to pick. Ann Oberhauser is a professor of sociology, and she published an article in The Conversation, and if you're not familiar with that, it's a nonprofit organization that publishes research-based articles for the general public, um, and it's a great way of generating publicity for some of the work that happens here at the university and in the college. So she published an article about her research into declining birth rates in the US, um, prompted by the finding that in May of 2021, the US recorded a 50% decline in birth rates since 1950. So over 70 years, uh, the birth rate has fallen by half. Research indicates that the overall trend in declining birth rates is largely due to women's changing roles. Increases in women earning college degrees, women entering the birth play, workplace, and advances in uh, reproductive health. And certainly, one third one here, Srimoyi Sen, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, one of our recent faculty hires, and she just received um, a prestigious award from the US Department of Energy's Early Career Research Program. That's the DOE version of the National Science Foundation Career Award Program, so it is similarly prestigious. She's one of only 83 scientists from American universities and DOE national laboratories who was selected for this award. She works in a field called quantum chromodynamics, which is about the strong force, that's the force that holds quarks together, and therefore protons and neutrons, and therefore all the matter that we know, in other words, holds everything together. So our faculty did well, as ex exemplified by these three examples, but your efforts to support our students over the past year also paid off. So what I have here are a few numbers. Um, the university, and this is for the year from 2019 to 2020, so this was the first year that was disrupted by COVID. What you see here is the university actually achieved a record retention rate of 88.5% of first year students returning for their second year. That's a remarkable achievement. And I know a lot of people were part of that. We had some intentional calling campaigns where we called students who had not registered to come back. Advisors participated, department chairs, many faculty members participated and called students. <clears throat> we made financial support available for students who were in financial crisis and could not register because they had an outstanding U bill. But all of that led to a record retention rate. Now the LAS retention rate every year is a little bit lower than the university overall, but this is also our strongest in at least a decade. So we also did very well as a college. And as you can see here, um, the grades of the students uh, were even better. So students remained in academic, in good academic standing and actually did a little bit better in fall of 2020 than in fall of 2019 and uh, a larger percentage of students earned a C or better uh, compared to the previous year. So, you know, despite all of the disruption, the hard work of the faculty paid off. If you were a little bit generous with our students, thank you. This was the year when they needed it, and it was definitely called for. So, we will have tense data for tense day data probably today. I haven't seen an announcement yet, but they get officially released, I guess, if not today, then tomorrow. <coughs> so the photo there, by the way, um, is somebody I'm very fond of. This is our spring 2021 student marshal, the student who walked with us at this memorable um, event in, uh, in Jack Trice Stadium. She's from Singapore, graduated with honors with a degree in political science, second major in psychology, and minor in health promotion. 
And uh, she's just a wonderful student who did a lot of leadership work here on campus. She also um, per performed undergraduate research, was a recipient of our High Impact Award for undergraduate research, and completed a capstone with the university's honors program. And she's now at the University of Washington pursuing a master's degree in public health. Here are a few other students who are doing very well, you know, in the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. The Sci Starters program is the university's um, intensive entrepreneurial accelerator program um, that's offered through the Papa John Center. Um, this is for students who have already developed a fairly fleshed out idea for their business or for their project, and they can spend a summer um, in the research park, um, mentored by professionals to really develop their entrepreneurial idea and take it to markets. Um, every year we support a number of students from donor funds because that's so that they can participate in this program. And the three students you see here um, on the left is Mason Way. He is a spring English graduate who is developing a mentoring program for youth. So you can see some of these are nonprofits. Some of these are programs that support a community. Then on the top right, you see Jacob Schmieder. He also graduated in spring with a degree in biochemistry. And he really loved his time with a marching band. So he's developing lighting that you wrap around a musical instrument. And it is sound activated. So it's a little bit like what we knew from the old discos, except it is now you know, attached to the, to the original instrument. And Joe Allen, bottom right here, um, is going to be graduating this spring from the Greeny School. She created an innovative photography service that provides a safe place for LGBTQ youth to have their photo taken without fear of revealing their authentic selves. And I'm excited to see the LAS students who will be in the next cohort. I also want to give a quick shout out here to Rebecca Runyon. She joined us in January. Again, her position is funded by donor support. She will be our first director of our new Innovation and Entrepreneurship Academy. She herself is a recent Iowa State graduate and the owner of two businesses she started while attending the university. She's a supreme young professional, interacts extremely well, and her first cohort of young um, wannabe entrepreneurs are up, up and running. All right, so that was a little bit of an outlook back over a very, very small selection of accomplishments from last year. This could go on and on and on. Lots of good things, good things happen over a year, even when we're struggling with the pandemic. So let me tell you a little bit, you know, every year I have sort of a data section on what's going on in the college and I'm gonna talk about some of those things. So first of all, recruitment of new students. Good news here. Um, as many of you will know, all the recruitment efforts of the university moved about a year, year and a half ago, moved into the office of the provost. They are now much more data driven. There is much more modeling of how financial aid can, can be deployed to have maximum impact. And it's generated a lot of new energy and ideas. So that's been, you know, all around a really good thing. Um, they've done a lot of work, those teams have done a lot of work on redesigning financial aid strategically and beefing up our regional and international recruitment efforts. And one thing that I really like to see is that each time when they say, well, if we hire an additional recruiter to work in such and such an area, I'm going like, okay, increase cost. And then they come back and say, and our modeling shows us that this will generate this many new students. And I'm going like, okay. And then the even better thing is then they come back a while later and they say, we actually recruited this many students from this region and it typically exceeds the modeling assumptions. So this is really working very well. LIS, as you can imagine, is a strong partner. I like to brag a little bit. Um, first of all, you know, our incoming class is very strong. That's true for the university overall. It's also true for the college. And I always take a quick look at the College of Engineering while they're still bigger than we are, we're catching up. You know, last year our incoming class was larger than that of the College of Engineering, and this year our incoming class is larger again. So you know, I look a little bit um, over the fence there at the competition, a friendly look at the competition, okay? So, so that's all good. Thank you all. 
Um, as I've said in various meetings with department chairs, recruitment coordinators and departments, recruiting is a team sport. Even if it is not officially in your position description, you can still be part of it. If you see somebody walk around your building, be friendly, say, can I help you? Are you a prospective student? Be nice to them, interact with them. This is why students come here because they feel personally seen. Okay, so everybody can be a part of recruiting. Even better, if you're willing to meet with students as they come for campus visits, our biggest acceptance rates are the students who come to campus visits. If we get them here, if they see the beautiful campus, if they get to interact with the community here, a faculty member, a department chair, that's what makes the case for them, you know, admittedly with a good scholarship and financial aid package. And we're much more competitive in that domain now, thanks to um, some of our donor support, and more about that later. Okay, this is overall enrollment. Um, and what you can see here that even though our incoming class is strong, we're still graduating very large classes, you know, from the big peaks we had four or five years ago. So what you can see here, the numbers for 2021 are the most recent estimates, so these are not official figures. Like I say, the official figures will be released here, you know, probably tomorrow. But this is going to be so close that if I were to plot the real figure, you wouldn't be able to see the difference, okay? So you can see that we're still coming down in enrollment. But hopefully, we're going to see uh, a little bit of a turn in the trend. The figure on the right is the college's market share. So what percentage of overall students at Iowa State University are enrolled in LAS? And you can see for a number of years, that um, market share, that percentage was dropping, but it has really turned around. And there really are two drivers for that. We have completely transformed our scholarship programs. Again, more on that later. Um, and we have seen remarkably um, good graduate recruiting figures. Okay, I don't think we have grown so much our graduate programs, but other colleges have uh, pulled graduate programs back more strongly than we have. So, you know, some of that growth is driven by the undergraduate side. Some of it is also driven by graduate students in the college. So, our market share at about 24%, that's, I would say, pretty healthy and pretty close to what I would call sort of a long-term a long-term average. Student credit hours, those of you who know a little bit about the college budget know that two things matter, overall enrollment in the college and all student credit hours that we teach to our own majors and to everyone else on campus who takes courses from us. And what you can see here is that the student credit hours, you know, they grew as enrollment grew, and then they came down as enrollment came down. So, you know, that's not unexpected. What's of bit more concern is a chart on the right, and again, that shows you our market share of student credit hours, the percentage of all student credit hours taught by LAS. And what you can see there is, unfortunately, is pretty much a straight line um, in the wrong direction. So whether the university is growing or whether the university is not growing, unfortunately, our share of student credit hours um, is, is, um, is pretty much you know, falling at a steady rate. And that's a difficult issue for us to handle budget-wise. Okay? So is this just something to look at? Again, one can have a long conversation about why that is. Some of these are things that we do not want to change more and more students are bringing credits into the university. Many of our incoming students are de facto sophomores the moment they set foot on campus. And these credits are predominantly all LAS credits. But we're not gonna tell the students to come here and take everything over, you know. That would not be serving them, that would not be serving the parents. We just have to deal with the consequences. Okay, so, you know, here is the really challenging news for those of us who work in the college office. Um, this is the amount of money that we have to spend on everything that moves in the college. So this is like your net income. This is your gross income after taxes. And what you can see here is that after peaking in 2016, it's since then been pretty much going down and it's more or less where we were in fiscal 14. However, our expenses are not what they are in fiscal 14, you know. You are not working for the same salaries that you had in fiscal 14. So the actual um, revenue loss here is, is quite a bit higher than what you see here. And I have a little bit here on the next slide, which shows you that since the peak, 
we've lost about 18.6 million. Um, that's about 15, 16% of our total net um, income. Um, and that has to be combined with at least 7 million in cost increases over the same period of time. So that's a lot of money that um, we don't really have a, a good revenue source for right now. Now, you know, we have obviously worked on this very hard in the college office. I mean, you have all seen the consequences in reduced hiring. Um, so that has reduced our exposure. It's not as if we're running a $25 million budget deficit year after year. But nevertheless, we are still, for the current year, estimating a budget deficit of about $11.4 million, or 11%. That happens to be the same numbers, 11% um, of our budget. That's a large number. We've been running budget deficits here for a number of years. And we're just not a at a place anymore where we can just wait for natural attrition to happen, to catch up with, to get the college onto a financially sustainable footing. We are covering these deficits right now from one-time reserves that accumulate in the departments, that accumulate in the college. You can imagine you never balance a budget like this and, and hit the target right on the, on the money. So there's always maybe a little bit left over at the end of the year. It's those reserves that we're currently burning through. And that'll get us through about two years. So now is the time to reimagine the college as we know it. And I'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the outlook for the future, you know, what could that look like and how will, um, what, what process are we going to follow? as we go through that um, you know, challenging exercise. Now, um, recruitment was good news. I want to share um, some additional good news, um, of which some of you may be aware of. Um, what I just told you is we have a budget outlook, which is, uh, to put it mildly, pretty challenging. And so fundraising is more important than ever at this point. Um, I'm going to tell you about some pretty big numbers. Okay, and they're pretty big numbers compared to the budget deficit that I just talked about. Unfortunately, I can't take those big numbers and use them just to fill the hole in the LAS budget. And why is that? That's because many donors direct their support. I can't use it to pay your salary as much as I would want to. The donor tells us you need to give this money as financial aid to a student with financial need. or I want this money to support a named professorship. Again, in that case, I can recognize and reward someone, more about that in a minute, but I can't use it to plug operational deficits in the budget. However, these funds help us indirectly, okay? They help us reward and recognize faculty and fight retention battles successfully. And in many cases, we can use donor funds where in the past, we might have used general funds um, in order to be able to compete with another institution. So very often, if somebody has a retention, <clears throat> we make some research money available. Um, five years ago, six years ago, most of that money would have come from the general fund budget. Um, at this point, it's typically coming from donor funds. Okay, the name position itself comes from donor funds and maybe some additional equipment purchase or whatever it may be that somebody wants, we support from donor funds. I'll tell you a little bit more about scholarships in a minute. Um, that is a situation where we have really um, have transformed the situation. So um, as you may have heard, the university has just completed its last uh, capital campaign, as they're called. It's sort of a period of time when all the fundraisers, the deans, everybody involved with fundraising is on a special high alert, we set ourselves targets and then we work with all of our donors and supporters to reach those targets. And we've just completed the Forever True for Iowa State campaign. Uh, it wrapped up in July. Um, it was originally a $1.1 billion campaign for the university. The fact that it was over $1 billion was already considered to be an ambitious move for us. But then several very large gifts came in. First and foremost, the large $160 million gift to LAS. Um, and second, a $50 million gift to the College of Business. And so the university upped the goal when they saw they were doing very well and they were you know, on target to exceed the goal way too early. 
um, they upped it from 1.1 to 1.5 billion. Then, of course, the pandemic hit and all travel and personal contact with donors ended. So we worked pretty hard over the last few years. You know, shifting courses online was a heavy lift. Shifting, shifting donor relations into a virtual environment was a heavy lift. But we hit the university target. The college also got a very ambitious goal, again, due to our sex success with the transforming uh, liberal arts and sciences gift. So we had a goal of 300 million, and we got over that with a little bit of room. Not a lot of room, but with enough room to call it you know, mission accomplished. So again, this was really um, a remarkable accomplishment, especially considering that the final year and a half um, were already impacted by the pandemic. <clears throat> So let me talk for a moment about some of the direct impact on the college. So we had four priority areas going into the campaign. And by the way, these are not terribly specific because we want to leave a lot of space for donors to follow their passions. So our four priorities area were was putting students first, that's scholarship, experiential learning, support, et cetera. Empowering our educators and leaders was the second one. That's really named faculty positions, innovation awards, et cetera. <clears throat> Driving discovery, engagement, and innovation. Again, this is more sort of one-time funds to support issues and enriching learning environments. We wanted to open the door for donors to you know, give some support for infrastructure projects. Um, that didn't have so much of an impact for us, but the other three certainly was great. Now, let me tell you some numbers, okay? When we started the campaign, we barely handed out $1 million in scholarship support for students. That number has tripled. And this is really thanks to a lot of donors who gave to scholarships. It's also thanks to the fact that we have the Transforming Liberal Arts and Sciences Endowment, and we're making a significant amount of resources available to support students. These are dollars which we use for recruiting students. Good students get an automatic scholarship award. Um, we have opportunities for students, prospective students and current students, to uh, apply for scholarships, and again, it is just completely different from where we were um, just a few years ago. <clears throat> Let's see, we also have seen a dramatic increase in the number of named positions, about 30 new ones. I think we were probably at about, if we had 20, that's a generous estimate, okay? So we've more than doubled the number of, of named professorships, chairs, et cetera. Um, and I see some people in the room who are holders of these positions. Some of them move around. Some of them stay with people for a little while. So again, this is an opportunity for us to say thank you and to recognize you know, some of the people who have had the biggest impact on the college. And I wish I had more because there are lots more people in this room and in the college who have a big impact. But we'll keep working at it, and that number is not going to go down. <clears throat> so that's been great. What else do we have? Um, we have these innovation awards now. We didn't have those at all before. What that really is, is a fund where we can say to a faculty member, you're really doing an incredibly interesting job and in, uh, interesting work in the area of X. You know, here's 25,000 or 55,000, $50,000 $50, for you for the coming year, the coming two years to really advance your research and get to that next level faster. Some of those are directed in area. Um, some of them are completely open. <clears throat> so, you know, those of you who've heard of the Dean's Emerging Faculty Leaders Award that falls into this category, uh, there's something called the Trap Award, the Castling Award, the Gardner Rondi Award, et cetera. So there are a number of those. We had none when the campaign started. We now give typically about seven or eight per year. Again, sometimes key in retaining a faculty member or just saying thank you. <clears throat> One thing we're gonna announce very soon is a new fund called the Frontier Science Fund. Those of you who've been here a while, you may remember the Signature Research Initiative. This is very similar. We'll make some seed funding available. Joanne is gonna lead the process of, it's, a, it's gonna be a proposal-driven process. Um, and we'll have some donor funds available now to sort of, if you like, institutionalize the Signature Research Initiative. This is one of the donors who really understands research. <clears throat> I do have to say, <clears throat> this individual, this donor, this donor couple is directing it at the science. So sorry, humanity, social science is not quite yet, but um, 
Um, we'll keep working on finding people who are willing to maybe increase this fund or generate other funds to support those areas as well. So that's a, that's a big impact. I already mentioned the Transforming Liberal Arts and Sciences Endowment. Huge impact on scholarships, huge impact on new named faculty positions. We have some programmatic support that we support out of this endowment uh, for those areas that the donors were especially passionate about, the performing arts in Greenlee. And we also use it sort of as a little, um, what I call an innovation fund for the college. If somebody comes with a bright idea, wants to start a new program, um, we can make some initial seed funds available to get that going. So even the budget situation is not great. We do have some funds available that we can use to invest and to generate growth in new areas of the college. Okay, what does, what up next? Okay, so um, let me move forward and talk a little bit about what's next and move on here. Okay, I should say one thing here, which I have in my script. Um, I should really say thank you to the fundraisers in the college. Um, and again, you know, fundraising is a team effort those of you who support your students today, you are creating the donors of tomorrow, so thank you for doing that. But we also have a first class fundraising team in our development officers, and they're probably not here, but they may be watching this video. So I wanna give a special thanks to Mike Jens, our team lead. Um, I wanna give a, a very special thanks to his team, Angeline Mather, Eric Bensinger, who worked with us for a while, now moved to the College of Business, and Austin Rinker. They are the ones who traveled a lot. I traveled some with them, but they travel a lot and they um, help with moving all of these conversations forward. So they're just an awesome, awesome team. Okay, looking forward. Let me start by introducing some new leadership in the college. Um, first of all, we have two new roles here. Uh, Monique Benken, Monique, where are you? She's teaching, I know she's teaching. Um, that's always a perfect excuse. So Monique Benken is our new Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Like many of our other Associate Dean roles, these are now part-time positions, so she maintains 50% of her role in her department, and 50% of her position is in the college. She's an Associate Professor of Criminal Justice, Director of our Leadership Studies Program, now she's gonna wear a lot of hats, so that one she's already uh, relinquished to Amy, who's gonna do that on an interim basis. Uh, but she's also licensed to practice law in Iowa and California. Her research explores racial and ethnic disparities in complex systems, alternative adjudication methods, and a complex relationship between psychiatric disorders and justice system involvement. She's been recognized for her diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the community and on campus. Now, Monique is building her team, and what you see here on the chart are two new faces uh, who are gonna be part of her team. Um, on the left is Amy Rutenberg from the History Department. She's our new equity advisor. She's replacing Javier Vela, who used to do that role for the past six years, and so she's replacing Javier. And the person on the right is Arnold Woods. He's our new director of multicultural student success. He replaces Christy Oxendine, who moved on to uh, two different priorities in her life. So she's building her team. Then I already mentioned Rebecca Runyon. She is on the left here, the friendly, the friendly face there. Um, she is our new director of the new innovation and entrepreneurship activities. So. I already mentioned her. Brad Dell is the new director of music and the new department chair of music and theater. We're very excited to have Brad on the team. And Lynn Clark um, is the new interim, de interim department chair for the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology. And I know Lynn is here, right there. Brad, did he make it? He had an issue come up just a few minutes before the meeting, so he's probably handling his, his issue. Okay, what else? So I talked a little bit about having to, um, you know, reimagine the college. And so here are just some words about a very, very early thoughts of what form that might take. And again, it's very early. So we want to reimagine the college. 
um, with a focus on current and future student demand. Okay, we need to serve the students we're serving today, where the interests and the needs of students are today, and also where future students are going to be, a much more diverse uh, a much more multicultural student demographic that we need to look at. We need to be able to offer programs that appeal to those students. Um, we do need to increase revenue, okay? We can't just cut our way out of this budget situation. We have to find areas of growth. And again, growth driven by where the student interest and demand is today and where it is likely to be in the future. I think we do need to look at additional efficiencies. I know everybody groans when they hear that word, uh, but I think you know, as part of the um, impending uh, reaccreditation of the university by the Higher Learning Commission, we're going to be looking at curriculum maps and really understand how every single course in our curriculum contributes to the learning goals of your programs. That's a great opportunity to look at all the courses that have sprung up over time and to decide which of these do strategically address our learning goals and which maybe it's time to sunset or replace by something else. So there is an opportunity there to do a really careful reanalysis of curricula in different programs. And again, some programs may already be very streamlined, very well structured and organized. Some programs may have a little bit of work to do um, and be able to accomplish that as well. I talked a lot a moment ago about leveraging philanthropy Again, using donor support to offset some of our operational expenses, that's something where you know, I think we are very creative and will continue to be very creative. What other things? You know, we do have nationally recognized research programs. So I talked a little bit about student interest, student need. What about research? Well, we do have nationally recognized programs. We have nationally recognized PhD programs. Um, those are things that we want to sustain because we want to continue to be a major research university. And I think one thing which is important is resources will have to follow growth. Okay, I know everybody wants to come, I want to give you all the faculty positions and all the resources you want out of the goodness of my heart. I wish I could do that. But the situation being what it is, resources will follow growth. So if you have a program that you can grow, um, that will make the argument for additional resources. We also have to be willing to look at the flip side, which is programs that have not been able to grow, where maybe the student interest is not there. Um, we need to be able and we need to be willing to look at that as well. Now, the process itself has to be collaborative. I can't make these decisions on my own. I need a lot of input that starts with my team, the department chairs the College Budget Advisory Council that is already involved in understanding you know, the budget situation of the college, the representative assembly, the faculty, the LAS Faculty Senate Caucus, um, and as appropriate as we move through this process, town halls with faculty and staff. So people are aware, people understand, people can have input, you know, as we said, um, you know, as we review data, as we may set, um, you know, um, metrics and quality measures for programs. So it'll, it'll have to be collaborative, it'll have to be data informed, um, and it has to rely on broad input from around the college. So I think that's it. So let me thank you once again for all your support over the past year, your support of our students, your support of your colleagues, the great research that took place, um, we're still managing the pandemic, at least we're here back in person, which I think is um, progress, even though you know most of us are still masked and uh, maybe a little bit nervous about where we are and where we're going. Uh, but hopefully, you know, people will continue to see the value of vaccinations and other mitigation measures and will continue to make progress and eventually find a way of living with uh, COVID in a way that has reduced it to what we consider acceptable risks. There is no such thing as a risk-free environment. Uh, you walk out of the door in the morning, you encounter certain risks, but we need to get COVID to a place where the risk is acceptable and we're not there yet. Okay, so, so much about the state of the college. Thank you all very much for your attention.
right, now we'll move on to the remainder of the program. Um, and the first thing I want to do is I want to welcome the members of the LAS Representative Assembly and the Faculty Senate, all the people who are involved in shared governance on behalf of the college. So for many years, Convocation has been the first meeting of the academic year for the College of LAS Representative Assembly. It's not the Faculty Senate's first meeting, but I do want to take a moment to acknowledge how important faculty engagement is and to thank members of both bodies for your time and for your service. So if you are a member of the LAS Representative Assembly or the Faculty Senate, would you please stand and be recognized? So today, we will celebrate many high performers in the college and then later this fall, President Winterstein and the Provost will host the faculty and staff recipients for the University Awards. So the first thing I want to do is I want to recognize colleagues who are new to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences since our last convocation, that would have been two years ago. In your program, you will note a number of new staff across the college, departments and programs, as well as new tenure track faculty, new multi-year lecturers, and new departmental and program leadership. So if you are here um, with the following new chairs and program leaders, stand if you're here. I know Monique is teaching. I know Brad can't be here. Rebecca? Yes. It's also teaching. I know Lynn, we already waved at Lynn. Okay. And Ridesh is technically also still new. Ridesh Rajan, computer science. Okay, he's watching the live stream. I promise he's watching. I'm just kidding. Anyway, I want to thank all of these outstanding leaders. I want to welcome everyone who is new. You will see the people listed in the program. But if you are a new faculty member or staff member, who arrived since last August. Would you please stand and be recognized? So if you're new to the college over the past year, please stand. Just in case you wonder, it is more than three people, okay? So don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Okay. So um, the other group that I want to recognize are our promoted faculty. So congratulations to all the new associate professors, the new full professors, and the newly promoted term faculty members. Um, they are all listed in the program, and we want to congratulate everyone who was successfully promoted or advanced on this significant achievement in your professional careers. OK, now we turn to the awards portion of our program. So we're extremely fortunate in the college to have awards, a broad portfolio of awards that recognize faculty successes in research, scholarly achievement, teaching excellence, advising, service, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and many other areas of faculty and staff performance. We begin by recognizing the recipients of awards that are funded through the generosity of our donors. Uh, many of these recipients will be recognized at other ceremonies and events through the academic year, but we do have a few who will receive their awards at our ceremony today. I'm now going to invite Associate Dean Amy Slagle to the podium to announce those awardees. Amy? Thank you, Beata. As the Dean stated, we'll begin with a few of our donor-funded awards. Awardees, when your name is called, please come forward to receive your award from Dean Schmidtman, and please stay up front. We like to take a group photo of the donor award recipients together for our donors. As a reminder, Beata is wearing her face mask, and we'll watch for your cue. And if you want your photo to be taken, Without a mask, take off your mask, and if you want to receive a handshake, hold out your hand, and otherwise, just use your body language to indicate what kind of uh, elbow bumps or whatever you want to celebrate your rewards. We begin today with three Castling Family Faculty Awards. 
The Castling Family Faculty Awards were established by Randall and Lori Castling of Omaha, Nebraska, in honor of Randall's parents, Robert and Rita Lenore Dunn Castling. Today, we congratulate Kaysen Murphy, Assistant Professor in the Department of Music and Theater, who receives the Castling Family Faculty Award for Early Achievement in Teaching. Congratulations, Case. We also congratulate Jean Bourgeois, professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, as the recipient of the Castling Family Faculty Award for Outstanding Teaching over an Extended Period of Time. Congratulations, John. <laughs> Our final Castling Family Faculty Award is the Castling Innovation Award. This award helps outstanding faculty members move innovative research ideas forward from their initial stage. Congratulations to Stephanie Madden, professor in the Department of Psychology. Stephanie, come forward to receive your award. They have a group photo now for the Castling Awards. And while they're doing that, I'll start talking about our next award, the Shake Shaft Master Teacher Award in Humanities and Social Sciences. This award was established in memory of Jerry Shake Shaft by his family, friends, and colleagues. Dr. Shake Shaft was a longtime political science professor at Iowa State, dedicated to the positive impact of undergraduate teaching. This award is presented to an outstanding teacher in the humanities or social sciences. This year's recipient is William Carter, associate professor in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. Bill, please come forward for your award. Congratulations. <laughs> We now move on to the LAS Awards presentations. We do have exceptional talent in this college, and I am delighted to recognize faculty and staff recipients of the 2021 College of Liberal Arts and Science Awards. As for process, I will read the award category, then the name and department of the awardee. Award descriptions and an overview of their work is included in the programs that were on your seats today. Awardees, when your name is called, please come forward, receive your award, and have your photo taken. Our first award recognizes the outstanding advising that happens in this college. The Ruth W. Swenson Award for Outstanding Advising celebrates individuals who have demonstrated outstanding performance as an undergraduate academic advisor over an extended period of time. Jessica Hansen Monk is this year's Swenson Award winner Though well, Jessica was not able to be with us here today, uh, we can all join her department colleagues in the Greenlee School to celebrate her work and to thank her for tackling her new role as a unit leader in the new LAS advising model. Congratulations, Jessica. We now move on to awards that recognize outstanding teaching. The Early Achievement in Teaching Awards recognize faculty members who have demonstrated outstanding teaching at an early stage in their careers. We have three recipients for this award. Our first award winner is Laura Michael Brown, an assistant professor in the Department of English. We'll give Laura a round of applause, though she's not able to be here with us today. Our second award winner is Gary Sawyer, Assistant Teaching Professor in the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication. Congratulations, Gary. And our third Early Achievement in Teaching Award 
is presented to Courtney Wilson, Assistant Teaching Professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. Congratulations, Courtney. Next in our teaching awards category is the Excellence in Undergraduate Introductory Teaching Award. This award recognizes outstanding performance by those teaching entry-level courses in their disciplines. Congratulations to Alexander Hall, Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. Let's give Alexander a round of applause, though he's not able to be here in person. But this year, since we're live streaming, Alexander might be connected from home, so we like to give our uh, rounds of applause. Our second introductory teaching award winner is Adasak Sukol, Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of Computer Science. Congratulations, Adasak. Our next award, Excellence in Graduate Mentoring, recognizes those major professors who serve as mentors who enrich the student-professor relationship. We have two recipients of this award this year. Jan Lauren Boyles, Associate Professor in the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication. Congratulations, Jan. The second Excellence in Graduate Mentoring Award goes to K.L. Cook, professor and LAS Dean's faculty fellow in the arts from the Department of English. Congratulations, Kenny. <laughs> I now invite Associate Dean Joanne Powell Kaufman to present our remaining LAS awards. Thank you, Amy. The first category of awards that I will present is our research awards, which honor those faculty who contributed significantly to Iowa State's reputation as a world-class research institution. Our Early Research Achievement Award honors outstanding research or achievements in the arts at an unusually early stage in an academic career. We have three recipients to honor with this award. First, Wa Bai. Assistant Professor in the Department of Genetics, Development, and Cell Biology. Congratulations, Wong. <laughs> Second, Chao Queen Lu, Associate Professor, Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology. I don't believe she can be here today, but we'll give her a round of applause. and Jacqueline Reber, Associate Professor, Department of Geological and Atmospheric Sci Sciences. Congratulations. <laughs> the Mid-Career Achievement in Research Award recognizes faculty who make outstanding contributions in research or the arts at the mid-career stage. Congratulations to our two recipients this year. First, Chun Hoi Chin, Professor, Department of Physics and Astronomy. Congratulations. <laughs> our second recipient is Mohan Gupta, Associate Professor in the Department of Genetics Development and Cell Biology. Congratulations, Mo. Our Outstanding Achievement and Research Award recognizes faculty who have a national or international reputation for contributions in research or artistic creativity. Congratulations to our two recipients this year. First, Jay Kwong Kim, Professor in the Department of Statistics. Our second recipient is Yan Zhao, professor in the Department of Chemistry. <laughs> Our 
Our next awards honor those who have extremely enhanced LAS and Iowa State through leadership, excellence, and service. The LAS Award for Early Achievement in Departmental Leadership recognizes department chairs or school directors who have demonstrated exceptional impact on advancing the faculty, staff, students, and or programs in their department or school within the first five years of their leadership role. Congratulations to this year's recipient, Dan Nettleton, Distinguished Professor and Chair in the Department of Statistics. Congratulations, Dan. The LAS Award for Learning Community Leadership recognizes faculty and staff members for outstanding coordination and leadership of a learning community in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Congratulations to Brenna Dixon, Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of English. The LAS Award for Inclusive Excellence recognizes faculty and staff who have advanced the college's vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion through their teaching, scholarship, service, or outreach. Congratulations to this year's recipient, Xuan Hien Nguyen, who cannot attend this event, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics. Our Outstanding Achievement in Extension or Professional Practice Award recognizes faculty, campus staff, or field staff members who have demonstrated outstanding performance in statewide leadership or extension and or pre professional practice and have achieved national recognition of their contributions to outreach activities. Congratulations to Dave Peterson. <laughs> Lutheran Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science. The LAS Award for International Service recognizes faculty members for outstanding international service in terms of teaching, research, or administration within the United States or abroad. Congratulations to this year's recipient, Jean-Pierre Tautel, Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. We also honor excellence by our professional and scientific staff. Congratulations to the following recipient of our Professional and Scientific Excellence Award. Vanita Curie, Senior Manager of Budget and Finance in the college administration. Congratulations, Benita. <laughs> Our Merit Excellence Award honors merit employees who have achieved excellence in their respective fields. We have two recipients to honor with this award. First is Sarah Calson. Secretary in the Department of Psychology. Congratulations, Sarah. <laughs> Second is Helena Mudrick, Laboratory Technician in the Department of Chemistry. Helena can't be here today. Let's honor her with a round of applause. <laughs> so this concludes our LAS awards presentation. So please join me in giving a round of applause to all of the recipients. I would now like to invo invite Dean Schmidtman back to the podium to recognize our university award winners. So in the college, we also have several faculty and staff who have received university level awards for their teaching, research, and service to the institution. These individuals will be recognized later this fall. 
Today, however, we just like to celebrate their accomplishments, and I will read the names of the recipients. And if you are able to attend today, please stand and be recognized. Kason Murphy, Early Achievement in Teaching. Kason? Kate Paget Walsh, uh, James Huntington Ellis Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Introductory Teaching. Okay. <laughs> Sheng Lang Zhang, Jiang, uh, James Huntington Ellis Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Introductory Teaching. Jonathan Tsu, Lewis Thompson Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching Award. <laughs> Erin Wilgenbush, Outstanding Achievement in Teaching. <laughs> Our next recipient, Thomas Holm. Margaret Allen White Graduate Faculty Award cannot attend today, but let's give him a round of applause in case he's watching. <laughs> Robin Anand, Early Achievement in Research. <laughs> John Levis, Outstanding Achievement in Research. Christian Meisner, Outstanding Achievement in Research. <laughs> Volker Hegelheimer, Early Achievement in Departmental Leadership. <laughs> Frank Krenrich, Outstanding Achievement in Departmental Leadership. Heike Hoffmann and Adisak Sukol, Interdisciplinary Team Research Award. <laughs> Michael Bailey, Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. <laughs> Lynn Clark, Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. Donna Nide, Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. <laughs> Dean Adams, Distinguished Professor. <laughs> Carolyn Cotrona, Distinguished Professor. We also have Reuben Peters, named to be distinguished professor. He cannot attend today, though. <laughs> Charles Kostelnik, moral professor. <laughs> and Michael Gulimo, university professor. Really excited to be able to recognize so many university awards. I want to thank all the departmental nomination committees who put in so much time. Leslie Hogman in our office who works with those committees. So this is really a wonderful, a wonderful group of people, both the college and the university award, uh, awards recipients. So this concludes our program. Thank you all so much for coming. Once again, welcome to new faculty and staff. My sincere congratulations to newly promoted faculty and award recipients. Thank you to college leadership. Thank you to shared governance. Thank you all for being here today. And let's all keep our fingers crossed that we can put COVID into the rear view mirror here before too long. So please stay for a little while if you're comfortable doing so for the reception. If you are more comfortable leaving, we completely understand if that's your preference. But if you can stay for a little while, uh, enjoy some refreshments with colleagues. And thank you all, and have a really, really good new academic year. Thank you.